Thank you all for being here. Uh, Roxanne's quite right. I, <clears throat> whenever I'm giving a talk on the Middle East, I never, I never try to actually specify very clearly what I'm going to talk about. We uh, set this up months ago, and uh, at the time, <clears throat> uh, the last time I talked about the Middle East, I was talking all about ISIS uh, and uh, the you, uh, and the the challenges that we had in Syria and Iraq. I mean, I'll mention this briefly. Uh, but clearly the topic of the moment is Iran. So I'm going to be uh, turning my uh, attention primarily to Iran. But um, I always have to start my talks uh, by with an explanation and uh, pointing out to, uh, to anybody who really is interested in the Middle East that the current situation in the Middle East uh, has an extremely long pedigree, has an extremely long history. Uh, for those of you who've heard me talk before, please bear with me because I'm going to go over a little bit of, uh, of uh, history in order to be able to, to try to set the framework for what we're uh, dealing with. Um, we start, uh, and I'll, we can start earlier, but uh, we start uh, primarily with the, uh, with the Ottoman Empire here. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was five centuries practically uh, in uh, what it was one of the oldest um, political entities in the entire uh, world, in the entire history of the world, uh, but we, and it uh, met its end in World War I. And that's kind of where our uh, problems start. Uh, the uh, Europeans, and uh, in particular, uh, had been concerned about the Ottoman Empire for quite some time. And in particular, um, Napoleon had invaded uh, parts of the Ottoman Empire, Egypt in particular, at the beginning of the 19th century. And the French had a strong interest there. The British uh, had a very strong interest, interest on the periphery of the Ottoman Empire. And so the British and the French could have been considered to, uh, enemies of the Ottomans. So during World War I, the Ottomans, of course, sided with Germany and with the Axis powers. Uh, and the Axis powers having lost, uh, the Ottoman Empire was split up uh, by, uh, by Great Britain and by France into spheres of influence. So, but before that actually happened, the, uh, the colonial powers, that is Britain and France in particular, uh, had, already, uh, had already had a tremendous amount of economic influence in the, uh, in the Ottoman Empire and in Iran. Uh, and this had to do with the the, uh, with the, um, the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, the countries of the Middle East were arguably the most civilized in the world. Uh, they were the economically the most advanced. The living conditions were much better than in Europe. Uh, and uh, they, were, they were quite wealthy. Uh, but the Industrial Revolution changed everything. Uh, you're in, it uh, gave Europeans, in particular, uh, a great deal of economic and military advantage over the Middle East. And by the 19th century, by the middle of the 19th century, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire and the Iranian, uh, the Qajar Empire in Iran, was practically bankrupt. Uh, and they didn't have a modern army, and Russia, coming from the north, was uh, taking their territory, uh, and the British from the south was, was uh, uh, taking uh, their territory and their influence. Uh, and uh, so it was a really uh, dire situation. It wasn't clear <coughs> that these uh, rulers and the, these countries could maintain themselves. So they solved their problems. Uh, the rulers of these countries solved their problems by creating concessions uh, for the Europeans, essentially selling their nation's patrimony uh, to the Europeans. And this set up a dynamic uh, where the, there was a backlash, a public backlash to this, this, uh, uh, to this um, um, effort on the part of the rulers of the Middle East and the European powers. So the backlash was the Islamic movement of the 19th century. And every, uh, every uh, 20th century and 21st century um, uh, effort uh, that involves the opposition of uh, Islamic um, uh, of Islamic forces with the West dates already from the 19th century, from this 
colonial or neocolonial exploitation that took place at that time. And if you take a look, you'll see that there's a kind of a triangle here. There's the public, and then there are the people who rule the public, and then there are the European uh, economic forces. And the rulers aligned with the economic forces of Europe and the people who were left out were the public, the people in, the, in these countries. Uh, uh, e Egypt was uh, turned into cotton plantations. Uh, there were concessions that were granted to, um, uh, granted to uh, Europeans for the cultivation of tea uh, and for other kinds of agricultural products, uh, cotton and tobacco and uh, many other things. Mineral rights also were, uh, were bargained away and the, the money was paid directly to the rulers and didn't get down to the public at all. Uh, so the Islamic movement um, was a way of mobilizing the population against both the rulers and the Europeans. And that dynamic continues down to, to today. So when you see the, for instance, the Arab Spring or the Iranian Revolution in 1978, 1979, that is an, a, an emanation of this 19th century movement, resisting rulers, resisting Europeans. Uh, and by extension, the United States. The United States gets into the, uh, gets into the mix uh, at, the, at uh, the time of World War I. Before that time, the US was not interested or not involved in the Middle East at all. So the, all, the Islamic movements today then all stem from this backlash. So when after World War I, uh, the Ottoman Empire was divided up by the British and the French into, uh, into separate states that are really artificial creations of the Europeans that were created for, their, uh, for the economic benefit of the people who created those states. So they didn't have any, uh, British, Britain and France had no interest in the welfare of the people in uh, Mesopotamia that they had conquered you know, during World War I. Uh, and in particular, there was one resource that was very, very important to them, <coughs> that was oil. Around the time of World War I, the, uh, Great Britain started to uh, become really heavily dependent on petroleum in order to fuel its ships that were, uh, that were moving from India back to, uh, back to Europe. And that route to India was the key to British wealth uh, during the entire 19th century, part of the 18th century too, and then after World War, after World War I. So oil resources were paramount, and the British wanted to protect those oil resources at all costs. So the uh, British and the French also didn't care who they stuck together in these new political entities that they had uh, put together because they were going to have armies stationed in those new countries all the time. The French were going to be in Syria and, uh, and uh, Lebanon, and the British were going to be in Jordan, in uh, Iraq, the newly created country of Iraq, uh, and they also would be in Palestine. Uh, in the end, the state of Israel was created when the uh, Israeli, um, when the, uh, uh, the, the Zionist movement was able to fight with the British in order to create the State of Israel. Otherwise, if they had not won, the State of Israel wouldn't exist. So these armies, however, didn't last. Surprise, surprise. Uh, they were put in uh, power around 1918, uh, 1919, uh, uh, 19, 19, 19, 20. But by the 1950s, the colonial armies had all been kicked out of these countries. Uh, so uh, King Farouk was kicked out of Egypt and Nasser came to power. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the French were kicked out of uh, Lebanon in 1951, 1952, uh, and, the, um, uh, and the, the royal family in Iraq was also ousted. The only ruler that's still left is the royal family of Jordan. Uh, they're the only ones. Uh, and uh, they were also installed. They have no, they're not indigenous to Jordan at all. Uh, the, uh, the, the king of Jordan at the, uh, who was installed happened to be the, um, the son of the Sharif of uh, Mecca, uh, whose complicity with the British in World War I was rewarded by making his son king. And his other son, Faisal, was made king of Iraq. 
<coughs> so uh, this was a, a total put up job uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the British and the French. And it's hardly any wonder that many people in the Middle East today uh, will reflexively say all of our problems are due to the British or all of our problems are due to the French. There's some truth in that. <laughs> so here's, uh, here's Iraq today. And here's, the, here's what the, the British and the French uh, did uh, right after World War I. They created these zones of influence uh, over this Mesopotamian territory. And uh, this is the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, even before World War I was completed. Uh, here's a map that was uh, actually drawn by uh, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, which um, divided up the, uh, the territory into, you know, kind of rough spheres uh, that he thought would make, uh, would make sense as uh, new nations. But what we're talking about with regard to Iraq is the fusion of three Ottoman provinces, uh, the first being Mosul, the second being Baghdad, and then the third being Basra. These provinces had never been together under one state structure, uh, and they were very, very different. Uh, the area around uh, Baghdad was primarily Sunni Muslim, uh, the area around Mosul were primarily Kurds. Some Kurds are Shia, some Kurds are Sunni, but their primary identification, ethnic identification, is Kurdish. And then in Basra, you have the Shia Muslims in, uh, in uh, the area of Basra, and they are the majority population in Iraq. The British um, didn't trust the Shia, and so they installed essentially Sunni ruler, a Sunni ruler, and the, uh, during the entire time of uh, royal uh, rule in Iraq, before the British were kicked out, uh, there was only one Shia um, uh, minister, and usually he was minister of education or minister of tourism, something you know, very, very minor. Uh, and the, um, and the, the Kurds never had a representative at all in the government. So uh, you can see that this was a setup for a real problem once the, uh, once the British had, uh, had actually left. Here's the, uh, the, the population, the Shia population is green, the Kurdish population is red, and as you see, the Kurds are not just in northern Iraq, they're all over the place. Uh, they were actually promised a nation uh, of their own by the British uh, before, World War, uh, before uh, World War I and during World War I, and they didn't get it. Uh, and so the Kurds are still extremely unha unhappy and extremely angry about the fact that they don't have a sovereign nation. They're the, the, today they're the, the, uh, the largest ethnic group that does not have its own nation. Um, so we, if we take a look at Lebanon, we see that the, the situation is just as crazy. Uh, you have all these ethnic groups in Lebanon uh, and uh, the French had a special relationship with the Maronite Christians in Lebanon. So when they created Lebanon out of a province of, uh, of Syria, they created Lebanon with the idea uh, that uh, the Maronites would always be rulers. So it's in the constitution uh, that, the, uh, that the, the, uh, the president of Lebanon is always going to be a Maronite Christian. The, the, never mind that the Maronites only have 15% of the population, uh, he's, all, he's always going to be a Maronite Christian. And uh, to tell you how interesting this is, uh, Lebanon has never had a census. Nobody wants to know what the actual population is in Lebanon. But I will tell you that the majority are Shiites. Uh, the majority are Shiite Muslims. And the, the, uh, the next largest group are Sunni Muslims, then the Druze, and finally the Maronite Christians. They are a, a real minority uh, within their own country. Many of them left in, uh, in, uh, in diaspora. You find them in everywhere, all over the world, West Africa, Mexico, and also here in the United States. <clears throat> Syria has the same problem with many ethnic groups, but a different sort of problem. Uh, whereas uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, you have the majority population the, uh, the, with the largest, uh, uh, largest section of the population being Shia, being um, ruled by a minority uh, Maronite um, uh, president uh, and uh, also Sunnis. Uh, but in Syria, it's different. In Syria, you have a minority, um, a minority ruler uh, representing the Alawite community, which is a branch of Shiism. 
Um, and the majority population in Syria is Sunni. And so this is, this is a situation where you create a lot of dissension. And uh, as a general political, as a general political rule, uh, so you can take this to heart, a majority ruled by a minority is a very, very bad thing. <laughs> this, is, this, has, this is a general principle in human life. Uh, and so if we, uh, if we ever find ourselves, some hap if we happen to find ourselves someday in a situation where we have a majority ruled by a minority, you know that that's a real problem. Uh, uh, and it, you can take Lebanon and, uh, and Syria as an example. So we have all these ethnic groups in Syria uh, that are um, that have uh, spheres of influence there, and the the, cur the current Syrian conflict really stems from the fact uh, that the, uh, the the minority Alawites have uh, maintained power ruthlessly uh, over uh, the other populations in the country in order to continue to survive. Now they also will tell you that if they were to step down or if they if they were to be overthrown, that the majority population would have no problem uh, actually going after them and probably slaughtering most of them. So uh, it, is a, uh, it is a serious uh, problem of survival for everybody in, uh, in Syria. Uh, so we see uh, in 2013, we had, um, uh, we had control uh, by rebel forces, by the, uh, uh, the forces loyal to Assad, and also uh, ISIS in, uh, in Syria. But ISIS has been more or less uh, defeated and, and routed from its uh, territory in, uh, in Syria. Uh, but the, com the situation was extremely complex uh, with actually three groups uh, that, were, uh, that were trying to um, gain power in the country. I think someone's trying to get in. Um, we could, no? Or just the wind, okay. Now, uh, however, uh, we're, I'm going to leave Mesopotamia. It's a, a definite problem, uh, a continuing problem, and it also Im impinges on our, uh, on our question about Iran to turn to Iran. Now, Iran, unlike Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel, Iran is an integral nation of, uh, historical nation of great antiquity. Now, one of the problems that uh, we have in, uh, had in Washington was the, uh, was the, uh, a, a, well, we always, we seem to be suffering a lot from this, and that is general ignorance <laughs> about the Middle East. Uh, and so the uh, people in Washington look at these other, um, these other nations, these other artificial nations, uh, Iraq or Lebanon or Syria, and they say, oh, there are all these ethnic groups and they're fighting uh, each other all the time. And so they look at Iran, and actually Iran has a lot of ethnic groups too. Uh, and so they say, well, those ethnic groups must hate each other. And so one of the strategies uh, for people who were uh, trying to gain power over Iran was to say, well, let's, let's, uh, let's empower some of these ethnic groups in Iran so that they, we can start a fight and then they will overthrow the government. Uh, but this is just not how Iran is constructed. Uh, Iran is, um, uh, Iran had a, a great deal of difficulty with the European powers over the last 150 years, but Iran has been an, uh, an integrated multicultural nation for thousands of years, uh, back, to the, uh, back to the very, very earliest uh, days in, among the, the Achaemenians, uh, the pre-Islamic days. Uh, and Iranian civilization is a transcendent concept. Uh, it, it, it encompasses the Jewish population, the Armenian Christian population, many, many ethnic groups, Baluchis, Kurds, and <coughs> Turkmen, and even Arabs uh, in the country, uh, who, are, uh, who understand the, the history of the country and who have been living with a, uh, an integrated cultural uh, situation for many, many years, uh, many thousands of years. But as I was pointing out, the <coughs> Iran has had a lot of problems with the um, with the West, with Europe, and with the, uh, uh, and also with the United States following World War I. Iran was effectively ruled by Great Britain and by Russia 
during the 19th and the early 20th centuries. Uh, the Russians essentially took charge of the north and the British essentially took charge of the south. Rulers were very weak. They also, as I pointed out to you, had uh, these economic arrangements with Europe, which made them dependent on the European powers. They also borrowed money from them. <laughs> uh, and that put the country in debt and also gave the, uh, gave the, the uh, European powers a great deal of, um, of influence and power over, over what they were doing. The Russians, for one thing, uh, controlled Iran's borders. Uh, they, uh, they went to the rulers and they said, you know, when you have goods moving into your country from outside, you can collect money um, on those goods. You can collect tariffs. And the rulers said, oh, really? My goodness, that's a really interesting fact. So they needed money. And the Russians said, you know, we'll just, uh, we, uh, we can do the same thing when things are moving from Iran to, you know, to Russia. Um, but um, so, um, so we'll, we'll give you the best deal you could possibly imagine. That is, we know how to do this, so we'll just collect the tariffs both ways. <laughs> and we'll give you your cut, sure. <laughs> so that was, uh, uh, that was a, a problem. The British found out about that, and they started collecting anything coming in the, from the Persian Gulf on the south. Uh, and this was, um, uh, this was clearly a, um, a, a serious economic problem. So there were already uh, real difficulties with, the, uh, with Europeans and Iran uh, during the 19th uh, and early 20th centuries. Uh, the, uh, the British were influential in uh, overthrowing the Qajar monarchy and they installed a military commander, Reza uh, Khan, who became Reza Shah uh, in uh, 1926. And they, he continued to rule with an iron hand uh, in Iran uh, in partnership with Europeans developing railroads, banks, and so forth, uh, but was ruthless as a, a ruler. He was a benevolent despot. But in, in, 19, uh, after, in World War II, it was thought that Reza uh, Shah was not sufficiently supportive of the, um, of the American and British uh, and, uh, and French powers fighting Germany. And so he was deposed. He was sent to South Africa uh, in exile, and that's where he died. And, the, uh, uh, and his son, uh, Reza Shah, uh, Mohammed Reza Shah, was uh, installed on the throne. Mohammad Reza Shah was a 20-something uh, kid who had uh, really no particular credentials for ruling. He liked women, he liked fast cars. He wasn't a, uh, wasn't, he was kind of a playboy. Uh, and he had no real, uh, had no real skills at, uh, at governing. But again, you know, for, from the standpoint of the British or the, and the United States, this was in the late 1940s. Uh, it didn't matter because you see, the British army was always going to be there, and the American army was always going to be there. And so if there was any problem uh, that arose, we wouldn't have to worry about, um, about his not being able to rule very well, because these foreign armies would always be uh, in place, and that we'd be able to control what went on. So, um, in, but in 1952, uh, the uh, Prime Minister, Mohammed Mossadegh, was elected, and uh, there was a popular uprising in the country, uh, and the Shah was, the young Shah was forced to, ab, uh, to uh, into exile. Uh, so the you know, United States and, uh, and Britain were frightened uh, because uh, they were worried, it was the beginning of the Cold War, they were worried about the Soviet Union at the time. They were worried that the Soviet Union would take advantage of this weakness uh, in the Iranian government and would, uh, would try to essentially push southward and gain a warm water port in the Persian Gulf. After World War II, they had already tried to annex or tried to uh, colonize two provinces of Iran uh, and were uh, actually expelled uh, as a result of an edict from the world court, probably the only time the world court ever did anything that actually resulted in anything. Uh, but the um, uh, but uh, the uh, Mossadegh 
was, uh, Mossadegh was then um, deposed in a counter coup that was arranged by the CIA and by MI6. And Iran, uh, and the, the Shah was then reinstated uh, in, uh, on the throne. Now, what, uh, what next happened was that the, uh, the British discovered that they were running out of money in by 1972. They were in real uh, problem, uh, they had a real problem, and they were maintaining a huge naval presence and a huge foreign presence in the Persian Gulf region, and also in the, on the Arabian Peninsula altogether. They had a, uh, essentially a colony in uh, Aden, <coughs> in, uh, the, on the tip of the Arabian Peninsula in uh, present day Yemen. They, they felt they could no longer uh, maintain this, so they, they withdrew uh, from the region. And again, the United States was, was petrified that the uh, Soviet Union would take advantage of this and would push down to the, uh, the Gulf, capture all the oil and uh, capture a warm water port. Uh, so um, after the British withdrew uh, from the Persian Gulf region, the United States established what was called the Twin Pillars Policy. Uh, the Twin Pillars Policy, um, I've given you a date here, 1973, actually, we, they knew well in advance uh, that the British were going to withdraw, and so they began to, to work on this in around 1968. Uh, so the, uh, Iran was one of the pillars in the Twin Pillars Policy. Saudi Arabia was the other pillar in the Twin Pillars Policy. And these, these two nations were supposed to be the bulwark against the Soviet, against Soviet influence. And the Shah and the um, then ruler of uh, Saudi Arabia came to the United States and they said, well, okay, you want us to do this, right? Um, but uh, we don't have any real military equipment. <laughs> so, uh, so the United States, um, the United States said, well, uh, don't worry, we'll sell you all the military equipment you want. And the, uh, and the, the, uh, the, the Shah and the uh, Saudi ruler said, well, um, what are we gonna pay? How are we gonna pay for it? Uh, and the United States said, well, you know, that's kind of your problem. In, do any of you remember in 1973 in the United States, do you remember trying to get gas? in 1973, uh, this audience has a few years on you, so, <laughs> so you know what was going on. What happened in 1973? The, the OPEC countries, Saudi Arabia and, and Iran and every other oil producing company massively raised the price of oil. And what did they do with the profits from that oil? They bought US arms. So my friends, Saudi Arabia and Iran were armed to the teeth and you paid for it. You paid for it. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is something that I think uh, most Americans, they certainly didn't know at the time. Uh, but uh, uh, today we now know, we've done the studies, we now know that the American taxpayer bought all of those arms uh, for Saudi Arabia. In fact, we're still doing it, but, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but th that, was how the, uh, that was how they got the the money to do this, and they were massively armed. Um, the, uh, both uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia didn't uh, just let the, uh, their beefed up military sit in an arsenal, they also used it to repress their own population. And so with a, a, with a very, uh, a, a, with a modern army, with modern weaponry, uh, it was uh, really uh, possible to crush any dissent that uh, was that that uh, could have come about. Now, uh, the United States government, the uh, and the CIA, we knew about this. We knew it very well. Uh, we knew that in that in Iran there were uh, there was there were executions. There were there was incredible imprisonment, a lot of repression going on. Uh, and not only that, but the United States was uh, was engaged by the uh, Shah to help develop the country. So the, uh, the nation, uh, Iran, was awash in U.S. consultants, U.S. construction firms, people working in the oil fields. Uh, at one point, there were 100,000 Americans working in Iran. Uh, and, the, and it was all being paid for, of course, by the Iranian government, but then really, you were paying for it. Uh, and, the, uh, uh, and a lot of these uh, projects 
were done um, kind of a little bit like the Chinese do it today. You want to build a bullet train in China, you just do it. And if, if it happens to go over your farmland, well, too bad. Uh, because, uh, and, if you, and if you make a, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, make a, a noise about it, then, you know, something maybe m might happen to you, it might happen to your family. Uh, so a lot of the development that, that went on in Iran was done in a very repressive way. So, um, the, uh, so this repressive regime was continued uh, uh, according to, along with uh, the support of the United States. So the, finally the Iranian population got, was totally fed up uh, with what was going on. The country was uh, modernizing very rapidly. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, westernized um, uh, culture was being imported into Iran. Uh, people who were highly religious and very sensitive were really concerned with morality. Uh, there was, you know, liquor, there were, you know, there were women running around in bikinis, and uh, this, all of this had happened in a very, very short period of time. It was a, a culture shock for the uh, population. And in, and in addition, all of the money coming into the country uh, really created an economic crisis, in particular a real estate crisis. Uh, land uh, and uh, homes skyrocketed in value, and so middle class people couldn't really buy them. Uh, and that was, uh, it was a, a, a kind of a mania in terms of, uh, of uh, income, uh, of, of a, a gap between the need for uh, housing and the need for other things, and the, uh, the ability of ordinary people to buy them. Corruption was very, very heavy, and the most corrupt place in the country, of course, was the court. Uh, if, you were a, um, if you were connected to the court, you could go to a bank, get as much money as you want, and uh, just spend it. Um, ben, we had one case that I remember where the, uh, a, uh, a cousin of the Shah, uh, and uh, this was again in 19, the 1970s, cousin of the Shah, and, uh, and uh, some European businessman went to a bank and they said they, they wanted to start a business. They got $100 million from the bank. <clears throat> And they, they looked at each other and they said, why should we build anything? Let's just go to Brazil, which they did. <laughs> <laughs> and they just left with all the money uh, and, and went to Brazil. And uh, I, they may still be there for all I know. <laughs> so the, um, the, um, the Iranian revolution was a great, great shock uh, to the United States. Uh, and if, if you take a look at the difference between the Iranian view of the revolution the American view of the revolution, you see what a disconnect there is here. Uh, first of all, the, um, the Iranians saw the Shah as being, uh, as, uh, as really abdicating his responsibility for the, the population, and they saw the United States as complicit, complicit with his abdication of responsibility. But the American view, they were, this is uh, in the United States, people were saying, why are they complaining? They, 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 we are modernizing the country. We were helping them. And, you know, and so now they're, they're so ungrateful, you know, they want to kick us out. Uh, and uh, this is, a, a, uh, this is a, a something that you'll hear even today uh, in some of the, uh, some of the neoconservative uh, takes on the revolution are Iranians were just simply ungrateful uh, and that uh, the, the revolution shouldn't have happened uh, because uh, they, they didn't know, you know when they had it good and that was when we were, you know, actually cooperating with them. So the Shah um, was, uh, the Shah and the United States by extension, then were uh, seen to abandon the Iranian people when I was there during the revolution. And when the army, uh, the army started to fire on uh, unarmed women and children in the public streets, that really was the end. Uh, and I, I saw it and I said, you know, this is, is not going to end well. The, the, the Shah can't do this uh, because in, uh, in, in Iran, in the hierarchical structure of Iran, although a person can be very important and very powerful, they ha still have a responsibility for taking care of those who are underneath them. Uh, and if they don't, then the people will in fact rise up and overthrow them. Uh, this is just as true in a governmental structure as it is in an office or in a university, any place. See it again and again and again, that uh, people who are maltreated 
uh, end up uh, end up revolting, and they they do on on a regular basis. So in the the, the United States, uh, our view was well, <coughs> um, uh, people choose their own rulers, and and uh, we don't we don't really interfere uh, in, in the in this situation, but uh, we can. But, but you know, democracy rules, and we can help people uh, try to uh, to understand their their best interests. And so, if the Iranians want to overthrow their uh, their their rulers, it may be stupid, but we don't care. Uh, but the United States was uh, was also having uh, was seen as having almost overwhelmingly materialistic motives. We had a, a doctrine of uh, what we call extraterritoriality, and that is that they negotiated a. a uh, an arrangement with Iran so that any American living in Iran, if that person committed a crime, they would they could not be tried in Iranian courts. Uh, they that doesn't it doesn't matter who it is. It might be a uh, it might be a uh, you know a jeep driver uh, who runs over somebody or uh, uh, somebody who was drunk. Uh, they they can't they couldn't be tried in the Iranian courts, uh, and so the. Uh, this was seen as, this was met with total outrage. In fact, um, the Ayatollah Khomeini, before the revolution, published a, an article where he said, um, he said, uh, uh, if an Iranian, uh, uh, if, an, if uh, sorry, uh, if the Shah runs over an American dog, he could be punished. But if an American runs over the Shah, he wouldn't be punished. <laughs> so, so. This was, uh, this got him exiled, by the way. <laughs> Everybody, and the, in the, the American view, well, it's all market driven. Everybody operates in their own interests. The competitive marketplace is the way to go and the way to conduct uh, international relations. Spiritual values don't matter. Religion doesn't matter. It's all, all, all money. Uh, and that's good from an American standpoint. Uh, the, these uh, religious things and spiritual things don't matter. So, one of the things we have to know, and I, I'm going to go through this quickly, is that the Iranian Revolution was not a revolution that was originally started, uh, that was originally controlled by the religious forces. There were three parties. Uh, first were the secular nationalists. They'd been around for decades. Uh, they had no religious interests at all. They were, they were the ones who uh, were who supported Mossadegh, and they go all the way back to uh, the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1909. Constitutional Revolution was a big thing. It really is a good constitution, but it was never really observed or implemented. Um, so the next group were the, the Marxist Islamists. Um, these are people who followed Franz Fanon and, uh, were, uh, and were Islamic, but they were interested in, uh, in uh, Marxism as a way of implementing uh, egalitarianism with, uh, within Islam. And they were also armed. And the, the primary group is the Mujahideen al Khalq, or the MEK. I'm going to come back to them in a little bit. And then the, another group, the Fadayana uh, Islam. And the third group were the religionists. These were the followers of Khomeini. All three groups <coughs> thought that they were, going to be, they were going to prevail after the revolution. They all three thought they were going to rule the country uh, after, the, uh, after the revolution, after the Shah was gone. And when you ask people on the street, and I did because I was there, uh, I, you'd, I'd say, well, who, are you, who do you favor? These, uh, these Mujahideen or the, uh, or the, the secular <laughs> nationalists or, the, or, or Khomeini? And the answer I would get was, I don't care who we get as long as the Shah is gone. So that was a little short-sighted. Uh, but uh, but that was how that was how angry people were at the time. Um, the secular nationalists prevailed for about six months. The, the first prime minister was from that group, and then the religionists emerged at the when the secular nationalists were discredited uh, at the time of the hostage crisis, which took took place six months after the um, after the um, uh, the, uh, the Shah had actually left and abdicated. The MEK also, when once the religionists took power, the MEK were uh, were also eliminated. A number of them were executed, but the majority were exiled. They went to Iraq, where they stayed in a uh, in a uh, a camp, 
uh, in Iraq and were protected by Saddam Hussein. They still exist and they're um, an important part of what's going on today. Uh, a lot of them live in Albania. Uh, they have a, an, an important power, an important um, uh, place in Europe. Uh, they were also protected by many of our politicians. Sam Brownbeck of Kansas uh, actually let them set up an office in his senatorial office. Uh, Ileana Ross Lehtinen in Florida also was protecting them and many, many others, M Republicans, of course. Um, so uh, the hostage crisis, we take a look at the, the two different perspectives on the hostage crisis. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini cemented his bona fides with his followers through the hostage crisis. If he had not done this, if he had not been able to uh, align himself with the people who were uh, taking the hostages, uh, he probably would have been uh, undermined and maybe even deposed. So it was a political move on his part to support the, the hostage takers. Uh, he had a nation to hold together and at that point he was the, the only force that really could have carried the, the nation forward after the abdication of the Shah and the discreditation of these other two groups that were in the country. Uh, and from the United States standpoint, there was this, the, the, the uh, political reality of Iran was of no import at all. All we, could, uh, all we could think of was the fact that Iran was an international outlaw and that was, it was violating these international standards of behavior. And the, it wasn't really even clear who was doing it. Uh, if we remember back to the time when um, ABC's Nightline got started, you know, it was America in crisis. Uh, the, uh, they, we, the, the newscasters uh, and the, the analysts looked around again and again and again. They were trying to find somebody who could, you know, turn a key and release the hostages. They couldn't find anyone. And they, the reason they couldn't find anyone is that, that it was systemic. It was a systemic problem. And the, uh, in, the, uh, in the United States, we never have these systemic problems, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we would like, uh, we'd like someone to, you know, be able, uh, some actor, some uh, political actor to get up and be able to, you know, again, push a button and get the stuff done that we want done. Uh, and uh, when anybody can cl even claim to do that, uh, we tend to support them, even though that may be a, a total lie and a total fabrication. But in the, uh, uh, but in, um, in, in Iran, we, couldn't really find a, a person to do this. So Khomeini outflanked the students uh, who really didn't have a, an ideology, uh, but he grafted the ideology of the Islamic Republic onto the hostage crisis and was uh, by expressing views that were even more extreme than those of the students. And, the, um, and the, for the United States, the United States said, well, you know, they should just give up the hostage crisis because we're more powerful uh, and so the, the political leaders of Iran uh, should just release the hostages, even if it may cost them their government, because we say so. Uh, and that was a, an unrealistic posture uh, on the part of the United States. We, I think many people still think that that's what they should have done, but, the, the, uh, but the, uh, the thing that was at stake was the revolution itself and the government going forward. So his priorities were, uh, were interested in, uh, his priorities were solidifying his supporters, solidifying his base, as it were, uh, rather than responding to the United States. Uh, and the more, the more that we demanded uh, stuff from, the, from uh, Khomeini, uh, the, the more, and the more he resisted, the greater his power. Uh, so he increased his power uh, by, uh, by being able to actually uh, serve as a point of resistance for the United States. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so again, um, in, in modern days, we, uh, in modern times, we can actually understand this political posture. <laughs> it's really not hard to understand. It's just that in, the, in 1973, uh, the United States was so outraged uh, that they thought that, uh, that the, the, the fact that we were being harmed and that we were being uh, insulted really took priority over anything uh, that had to do with nation building in Iran or preserving uh, the political status quo at that time. So um, for the United States, the, the end result was that 
Iran totally abandoned any possibility of friendship with the United States. But that didn't matter to Khomeini because his slogan was neither East nor West. Uh, he was as opposed to the Soviet Union at the time as he was to the United States. And he was trying to steer an independent course. Now again, I, if you all remember during the, uh, during the Cold War, the United States didn't like this. They didn't like people taking an independent course. It was either, you were either going to be on our side or you were going to be on their side, that is the Soviet Union side. And nobody could be in between. And I, uh, and I, uh, I remember I was in Washington at a, um, uh, at a, uh, uh, a briefing uh, for the uh, Department of Defense. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, woman said, you know, uh, during a coffee break, she said, I wonder if I can talk to you for a minute. And I said, sure. And she, she said, uh, you've, uh, you, you've worked in India too, haven't you? And I said, yes, I've worked a lot in India actually. actually. And she said, what is this woman, Gandhi, this woman, Indira Gandhi, what is she thinking? Uh, and I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, we can't tell whether she's on our side or the, or the Russia, you know, the, or the Soviet side. And, and she said, she's got to choose. She can't be, on, she can't be on, on, on both sides. And I said, I think she thinks she can. <laughs> and I said that, you know, it's, it's only you that have this, you know, this, this uh, idea of the world divided into two camps. And it's either us or, you know, or, or either you're our friend or our enemy. The idea of somebody being neutral and in the middle is really, really hard for, you know, for, uh, it was really hard for us to accept then. I think it's really hard for us to accept now. Uh, and we, the idea that somehow people could be an independent, uh, independent actor is a really difficult problem. So the, the hostage crisis was eventually resolved, and that's an interesting thing. The, res the hostage crisis was resolved according to Iranian cultural patterns. And it, the, this, the United States didn't really quite understand this. And so the uh, United States was mystified, totally mystified, at the, at the fact that the hostage crisis was solved. And we still don't know how. We still don't know the exact details. But I can tell you uh, that the, the, that the, the uh, hostage crisis was mediated, as a mediated solution by, uh, by third parties, by neutral third parties. And that's actually every single time we've been able to do anything with Iran, that's how it's been done. We, have a, we find, a, uh, we find a, a, a neutral third party who's able to mediate the, uh, to mediate the, the dispute between the two uh, uh, nations. Uh, and uh, I'll point out that's how it's going to be done if we ever get to an, 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 a rapprochement with Iran in, in the present day. The, uh, the Algerians were the ones who actually mediated. Uh, and the, uh, they were a, an odd choice, uh, but they were uh, you know, Muslim, they were sort of European, and so the, they uh, turned out to be uh, the, the kind of best uh, people to, uh, to actually serve as nominal mediators. So um, the Iran benefited almost not at all from the, uh, from the resolution of the hostage crisis. Uh, it, there was the, the and for, for uh, Khomeini, this showed uh, the Iranian population that this wasn't a profit-making venture. Uh, they, it was a spiritual and a, a, uh, and a, and a principled um, uh, event that took place. And so, but for the United States, Iran got away with something. They got away with a crime against the United States. And that is still how many of the people who were around at the time of the revolution feel. They are mad, mad, mad that Iran somehow got away with this and didn't have to pay a price. We didn't, they didn't get bombed. They didn't get, de the, their rulers didn't get deposed. They just, you know, were, were miscreants and they got away with murder. Uh, not exactly murder. None of the hostages died actually. Uh, and it was never, never punished. And they've been looking for ways to punish Iran for the uh, hostage crisis for the last 40 years. Uh, and they still are looking for some way to punish Iran. And, it, and when you, if you talk to uh, you, if you talk to any of these guys, and John Bolton, who we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, you, if, you, if you talk to, uh, to any of these guys, Bolton or any of the others, 
and you talk to them long enough and you, you they say, uh, uh, and, and you say, well, you know, the, the, there really wasn't any nuclear material and really uh, uh, Hezbollah is now an independent entity. It's not controlled by Iran. They say, yeah, but the hostage crisis. <laughs> and that's how they, that's how they, that, that's, that's still in the back of their mind. It's, they're resentful, they're vengeful, and they can't get, can't get uh, rid of the idea that Iran was somehow, somehow uh, spit in, in the eye of the United States and was never, never punished for it. So uh, the Algiers Accords uh, also uh, guaranteed that the United States would never, ever again interfere <laughs> in the internal affairs, in the internal affairs of Iran. That was one of the things the Iranians demanded. And why? Because look at the litany of things that the United States and the European powers had done uh, in the past. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, uh, so, uh, the, but from the standpoint of the United States, I've talked to these people in the State Department, they just said, oh, well, we just signed it because, I mean, we had to get the hostages, so, you know, so we didn't care what we signed. And we have never observed the Algiers Accords. We've never, we've never honored them. Uh, but then again, what treaties do we honor, you know? Uh, so, it was a treaty that was, it was, I'm not sure whether it was ratified by the Senate. That's an interesting question. I think I'd be, it was a, but it was an accord rather than a, rather than a, a treaty. Uh, so, but, uh, but it was, uh, but it was signed by our, uh, our representatives and they, and the representatives were authorized to, uh, to, you know, to, to, um, uh, authorized to sign it in order to uh, solve the, the hostage crisis. And the, the hostages, just curiously, you, for your curiosity, the hostages were actually held until the moment of Ronald Reagan's uh, inauguration as, a, uh, uh, as a, a last little slap in the face of Jimmy Carter um, in, the, uh, uh, in that, this situation. The Iran-Iraq War uh, took place almost immediately after the revolution uh, had been successful. Saddam Hussein was worried that the Iranians would invade Iraq and would depose him because he knew that the majority population in his country was Shia uh, and that the Iranians majority Shia population uh, were, were uh, very interested in, uh, in being revolutionary and exporting their revolution. So he was very afraid. He uh, attacked Iran first. Uh, Iran has never attacked uh, a, another nation as a first strike for the last 300 years. Uh, and this was no exception. So Saddam uh, uh, shot the first shot and the, the United States was petrified that Iran would actually win. And so the United States aided Iraq uh, in this war. Uh, the idea was, the, the, the doctrine that they were following was something that was called dual containment. Uh, they didn't think Iraq was very good, it was Saddam after all, um, but they didn't want Iran to win either. So the idea was for the United States to tilt in the favor of Iraq so that no one would win. So they'd, they'd fight to a stalemate. Uh, and that they thought that was the best possible outcome, that they'd just exhaust each other and, uh, and uh, they'd fight to a, sta to a stalemate. Well, it went on for eight years. Uh, and the, uh, the toll, the death toll in Iran was monstrous. And you have all these, uh, um, these soldiers who are uh, maimed and, uh, and uh, with uh, missing limbs and so forth, that were uh, that were considered uh, uh, heroes in Iran, martyrs uh, for the uh, for the cause. Not the least reason that the the most sacred shrines in Shiism are located in Iraqi territory. And so the uh, the Iranians were uh, they were able to motivate uh, the soldiers, especially young soldiers, by talk, talking about defending the Shiite shrines uh, in Iraq. So the, from the standpoint of the United States, the United States was interested in preventing uh, political ideology that would, would threaten Israel, they thought, and that would, would also spread disorder. So that was, how, that was the justification for aiding Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war while maintaining a public, uh, a public stance of neutrality. We were not neutral, uh, but we said so uh, in, uh, in international forums. Uh, there was no expression of regret, on, uh, and the Iranians were very upset about this. 
No expressions of regret for the fact that the United States supplied chemical weapons to Iraq and also shot down Iranian aircraft. Never, never apologized. George H.W. Bush, when a, a civil, civilian airliner was shot down uh, during the, uh, 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 over the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War, uh, uh, George H.W. Bush uh, went before the United Nations and said, uh, said it was Iran's fault. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have been sending civilian airliners into international space. So uh, the, this is something that's very, very bitterly remembered by Iranians, and uh, although people in the United States really have no knowledge of it. Um, and the, uh, the idea that for, uh, for the uh, United States is that Iran deserved absolutely no consideration because they were just bad people. They were bad actors, and there was the hostage crisis. <laughs> so, <laughs> So this is something that, you know, they just can't, people just can't give up on. Now in 1986, 1996, we had a, uh, a very interesting development. Uh, this was a, uh, a uh, paper that was written for, um, uh, for Benjamin Netanyahu when his, I uh, believe his first term as prime minister of uh, Israel. Uh, and the, uh, this was called a clean break. This was a, a, a group of American advisors uh, who, were, uh, who were going to suggest ways for, the, for Israel to act in order to be able to secure, uh, uh, in, in order to create Israeli security. So the report was, was prepared by Richard Pearl. Douglas, oh, there's a typo here. It's not Douglas, it's Douglas. <laughs> Douglas Fife. Remember those two? You may not remember uh, Charles Fairbanks Jr. or uh, Jonathan Torop, or but you might know David and Myra Wormser. Uh, these are these are uh, uh, really some of the most uh, fundamental uh, neoconservatives in the United States, and they were now they were identified started to be identified then as neoconservatives and are still. They called on Israel to transcend its foes by making a clean break. With the, from the Oslo Accords. And guess what? They have. The Oslo Accords are by and large dead. Uh, the, uh, the, the only thing that remains with the Oslo Accords are the, uh, is the, uh, the relationship between Israel and Egypt, uh, which uh, still, they still remain uh, non-hostile toward each other. But one of the, the, one of the points of the Oslo Accords is that they got paid off. And guess who, got, guess who paid them? <laughs> Us. <laughs> We're paying. We pay Israel, uh, uh, what is it, $6 billion a year, and we pay, uh, we pay Egypt $6 billion a year, and that's what keeps the accords going. Uh, but anything else with regard to the Palestinians has now been totally ignored. So the, um, uh, and there was a, a call to stop to stop, for Israel to stop talking about just simply uh, an, an Arab Israeli um, uh, Arab containment by Israel and start working regionally uh, to try to develop relationships throughout the entire region that would contain the enemies of Israel, that would be hostile to Israel. And the, the main point of this uh, clean break document was to, uh, to ca call for regime change throughout the region. And the three nations that were uh, they were called on to for regime change were Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Uh, and Iraq was thought to be the easiest, and so therefore that was the first one. This was again 1996. Um, so in 1998, or, so, oh, that's another typo, sorry, it's 1998, not 1988. Uh, we have the Project for the New American Century, uh, which is a, an, a, an offshoot of this group that developed this uh, clean break document. Uh, this is a, an actual think tank, a neoconservative think tank, and they carried on this clean break mission. 25 of the original signatories to the Project for the New American Century served in the George Bush administration. These included Bill Kristol, who was one of the founder, founders, Bill is not, uh, now a never Trumper, but uh, uh, also Robert Kagan, Richard Pearl again, Paul Wolfowitz, James Woolsey, Elliot Abrams, remember him? And Donald Rumsfeld, uh, and uh, uh, Robert Zolnick, and also John Bolton. 
And I guess I've forgotten to mention uh, uh, Dick Cheney because he was also part of this group. So these were, this is 1988, before the election of George H.W. Uh, Bush, uh, and, sorry, George W. Bush. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these people were already, uh, already had a plan in place for uh, reconfiguring the Middle East in such a way that they believed would create security for Israel. So once again, the, the, their explicit, uh, explicit call was, was to favor military strategies over diplomatic strategies. They said diplomatic strategies don't work, uh, the only thing that, the, that these people in the, uh, who are Israel's enemies understand is force, and so therefore there has to be military force in order to be able to actually create security uh, for, the, uh, for the state of Israel and also for American interests in the region. And this, this is what you will, uh, you'll hear people saying today. They're saying, they're, they're saying if, if Iran attacks uh, America's, America's allies or American interests in the Middle East, then we, we, have, we feel we have the right to initiate military operations against them. So um, then again, called for regime change uh, in, uh, in Syria, Iraq, and Iran. So this is 1988. Um, so the, 98, sorry, 1998, my mistake, sorry, 1998. It doesn't matter, it's still 20 years ago, okay? Yes, <laughs> 1998. Yeah. The, the, well, if you ask the Iranians, the British are controlling it all. But uh, no, the British have essentially withdrawn uh, from uh, from international uh, activity in the region, uh, and they they haven't they maintain an interest, uh, but they are not actively uh, they they are not actively involved with this kind of uh, of activity. So the British would not be supportive of uh, of Prince's regime. In fact, they've they've explicitly said they're not interested in, in, uh, in overthrowing anybody. Uh, they, were, they opposed the American invasion of Iraq. Uh, they, except for Tony Blair, who went along with it, but you saw what the British public uh, uh, thought of Tony Blair, he called him Bush's poodle. Um, and so that he was, uh, Blair was an outlier and eventually had to resign uh, as a result of his support for the Iraq conflict. Thatcher was involved. Thatcher was supportive of all of this, but the British had no, uh, they, they didn't feel that they could commit military forces or troops to any of this activity. So, um, the, uh, this died in 2006, but mysteriously, the website, the, the, the organization died, but mysteriously the website reappeared in January of this year. Uh, and so the you know the the ideology is back. It's it's in the ether. You know it's it's online again, uh, and uh, not surprising because this is precisely this 1998 and 1996 uh, blueprint for uh, activity in the Middle East is precisely what's being followed today uh, by the uh, by the Trump administration. But I my feeling is that Trump isn't smart enough to really know this. Uh, I, don't, I really don't believe he does. I think he, he if you, if he, if he were here tonight in this lecture, I, I think he'd be asleep or <laughs> he wouldn't care. So the economic sanctions were placed on Iran again and again and again in 1979. After the Algiers Accords, uh, there was uh, the, uh, Reagan uh, complained that Iran was uh, doing things in the Persian Gulf. He, he, the, these were. Um, these were lifted after the Algiers Accord in 1980. Uh, but Reagan, uh, so Reagan imposed sanctions in 1987. Bill Clinton uh, expanded the sanctions uh, to include uh, firms dealing with the Iranian government. In, in 2006, then, uh, after the uh, Iraq invasion, uh, people um, started, uh, the Bush administration believed that they could change the regime in Iran by uh, uh, by attacking Iran for their atomic activities. Uh, and so by 2006, the, um, uh, the uh, United Nations uh, Resolution 1696 had, um, uh, had put sanctions on oil, gas, and petrochemicals and was renewed several times. 
So in this decade, nine years between 19, uh, oh, 2006 and 2015, the UN sanctions and the European Union sanctions were in, in place in Iran. The JCPOA, who we mentioned earlier, passed in 2015, and the UN and European sanctions were eliminated, leaving only the United States sanctions, which were also relaxed at the time of the JCPOA. But in, 19, in 2018, uh, Trump, uh, uh, last year, Trump withdraws from the JCPOA, reimposes the US sanctions, but the European and UN sanctions were not reimposed. The problem is that the United States um, is, uh, is putting pressure on the world community <coughs> to observe the sanctions. And if they can only figure out a way to do, uh, to, have, to trade with Iran without using dollars, uh, then, they, uh, then uh, it, they would be able to uh, to resume uh, this uh, this trade and and uh, um, and also stop uh, uh, stop observing the sanctions that the United States is imposing on people, and that's why the Europeans were trying to find in, uh, financial instruments that would bypass uh, dollars and U.S. banks uh, to be able to actually uh, continue to observe the uh, relaxation of sanctions on Iran. And in 2019, uh, just now, just a few just a little, just this month, uh, Trump increased these sanctions. Uh, I, uh, I'm gonna, I, 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 I wanna have time for questions and I've gone over time, uh, but I wanna remind you all uh, that this, the JCPOA is all about uh, Iran's nuclear activity. And it's very important that you understand that Iran under all circumstances is still bound by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. This was signed in 1968. The United States is a signatory. There are only, uh, only five nations in the world uh, that, uh, are, that are not signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. One of them is Israel, which has about 250 uh, nuclear warheads by, some est by most of our estimates. Uh, in, uh, Pakistan, India, both have nuclear weapons. North Korea, of course, does. South Sudan doesn't have any nuclear weapons, but they're a new nation, and I suppose they may get around to signing it. But the, 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 the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, quite aside from the JCPOA, uh, requires that Iran not develop nuclear weapons and requires that other nations not supply them with the uh, facilities for developing nuclear weapons. But Iran is allowed, yeah. Sign the treaty? Yes, of course. And we are yes. Liberating. Yes. Okay. We're 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 in complete violation of the treaty. Uh, we uh, not only not only does the treaty require that uh, that other nations not uh, they, that nations not in uh, they, well uh, that not provide nuclear weapons to other nations, it also requires that nations who are signatories to the treaty reduce their nuclear weapons which we have not done. Uh, and the, uh, again, uh, you, you can stand on the street corner and yell and scream and shout that the US is in violation of this treaty, which was ratified by the Senate uh, in uh, 19, uh, it was not just, not immediately, it was like 1970. Uh, but again, treaties don't matter anymore. So, you know, so uh, the fact that the US is in violation of the treaty uh, doesn't mean very much. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the accusation of Iranian nuclear uh, 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 mil uh, military weapons development started by the neocons, including Richard Pearl and, and that group, uh, and John Bolton uh, after 9-11, uh, and it was, uh, there were false accusations also made by the uh, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the APAC, and their surrogates. And Iran never had an active nuclear weapons program, and it doesn't now, and it probably won't in the future. So the, uh, this is, a, um, a, this, is an, a, a, um, this is a false accusation. And here's uh, Jerome Corsi, uh, uh, who has been in the news as a result of the Mueller, Mueller investigations, uh, Richard, Stone's, uh, Richard Stone's good buddy, uh, who wrote this wonderful book called Atomic Iran, you see the atomic bomb in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the eyes of this veiled woman. There's so many bad things with this cover. 
that I can't even begin to tell you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is a, I, 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 uh, I'm presenting it to you because, you know, how many things are wrong with this? <laughs> so the idea of a, every possible bad trope. So other neo uh, accusations of against Iran. Iran is a chief state sponsor of terrorism. It's not even close to being true. It's a uh, it's just a slogan. Uh, Iran's missile program is illegal. It is not illegal, as a conventional conventional defense weapons are are not illegal at all. Uh, not even under a, a, a statement of concern at the time of the imposition of the uh, of the sanctions in 2006, which have now been eliminated uh, by the United Nations. And uh, the neoconservatives will go back to this. Uh, people like Tom Cotton uh, will say Iran's missile program is totally illegal. It is not. Uh, and nobody calls, you know, there's nobody to call him on it except me uh, and a few others. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Well, Iran, Iran's Iran's nuclear uh, uh, nuclear power program was, in fact, pushed by us, by Eisenhower, and continued under Kennedy. So we were the ones who started it. Um, so the idea that you know somehow they sneakily uh, developed you know nuclear uh, nuclear capability when we weren't looking, it was uh, is really completely foolish. Um, so the idea that Iran continues to develop nuclear weapons is there's no evidence, whatever, that this is true. And the uh, United Nations inspectors uh, regularly are inspecting everything going on in Iran, and uh, they are the, Iran is still complying with the JCPOA. So we have these uh, things like this APAC fantasy propaganda uh, that they uh, that they show, where here's this evil red Iran. Uh, that is uh, the spreading its hegemony throughout the entire Middle East, uh, and uh, makes it makes it look very very scary and very, um, uh, you know, uh, th this is the kind of thing that uh, that is brought into our uh, legislators' offices uh, to indicate the uh, the danger of Iran. It's quite a quite a graphic, actually. So um, I'm I get, I'm going to uh, I we really do want to have some questions. Uh, there is a state of engagement with uh, it, with Iran with no mediator in sight, and we need a mediator very badly. Uh, in the United States, the Iran would like to resume relations with the United States. Uh, I can tell you that for sure, um, if it could be done. But there has to be an immediate. There has to be a, a mediator. There has to be apologies for past behavior. There has to be some kind of sincere um, uh, thing going on. Uh, and uh, Pompeo and, and Bolton are running the show with regard to hostility toward Iran, and they still embrace these 20-year-old plans for military attack. They still want regime change. So Bolton even goes so far, I told you I'd get back to the MEK. Uh, the, the, the Bolton wants the MEK to be the rulers of Iran. And so here's, a, here's an address he made. This was in January of this year, just, uh, just uh, you know, a few months ago, the declared policy of the United States should be the overthrow of the Mullah's regime in Tehran. The behavior and the objectives of the regime are not going to change, and therefore the only solution is to change the, uh, the regime itself. And that's why before 2019, we here will celebrate in Tehran. This was an address before the MEK in Europe. It was an address before the organization, uh, more or less promising to uh, more or less promising that they're the ones that he's going to support uh, if the uh, if the regime in Iran is overthrown, and uh, and, the, and the, the final the the final the final point is that Trump has no idea has no idea what's going on. I mean, uh, the Trump runs on a completely different uh, logic logical framework, and that is that if Obama did it, then he doesn't want to do it. Uh, and if and but the 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 funny thing is that when uh, when the, uh, the 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 news about uh, United States sending troops to the Middle East and uh, and wanting to attack Iran came out, the headline said John Bolton orders troops to the Middle East. Trump hated that. He hated it because because Bolton got the headline. You see, uh, and so it, it's really. It's really, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Bolton would be out if he keeps on doing this. 
uh, because because Trump is operating on an utterly utterly different uh, plane of existence uh, than the than 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 the, the the reality that we have here. Uh, he's spiteful. He's vindictive. He wants the he wants the spotlight all the time, uh, and he has he has no clue about anything that I've told you here tonight. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there, and we'll have time for questions.